Hey, what's going on, everybody? Drew here. Uh, recently been receiving some questions regarding my workflow for editing exteriors or architectural images in general. Um, I just wanted to give a super brief look into what that process looks like for me. Um, so typically with interiors or architectural photography, uh, you'll see photographers blending multiple images together um, to get the best aspects of each one in the final resulting image. Um, typically for me, there's a few different ways they've worked best for doing this. Um, most of the time, I'm generally blending images using a 32-bit um, TIFF. And what this does is you take bracketed images at different exposures and basically merge them together into sort of a super raw file. And then I'll take that uh, super raw file of sorts uh, back to Lightroom and um, process it very naturally as if you would a raw file generally. Um, but it will have much more information in the highlights and in the shadows. Um, this typically gives me a more realistic look than if you were doing uh, photomatics or some of the um, tone mapping HDR platforms. Um, sometimes in addition to this or separately, I'll also use a more advanced Photoshop technique called luminosity masks. Um, and all these are is basically having Lightroom um, analyze the image for itself and see what the brightest areas and the darkest areas of the image are, and then having it make selections for you based on the brightness of the image. Um, so for example, if we go over here to the channels, um, luminosity masks are really um, harnessing the power of channels to make selections based on um, purely brightness, not color or anything else. So when you're merging photos like this, it's typically because of um, exposure differences. So this, um, as compared to manually uh, brushing or masking in these different areas allows you to have gradients or natural blending um, that you can do manually. Um, so on an exterior image like this, um, there's really four primary things you'll be looking at um, working on. First of all, uh, there's a lot of cloning and compositing um, that takes place. So here's the final image of a shoot that I just did this March um, here in Minnesota. So the grass uh, here up north is definitely not green yet. Um, so that was one of the cloning elements. And then if you take a look at the before here, there were also a bunch of cars. Um, there were a lot of um, little posts we used. Uh, so the snow plows know where the curbs are. Um, a lot of arrows. Just a lot of general cloning and cleanup to make the image less distracting. Um, secondly, color correction is um, obviously a must. That's typically just trying to make all the colors look like what you saw in person. Um, for me, this typically means more removing of color than adding, typically. Um, a lot of the time you'll have color casts or glare, um, especially in interiors, you'll have glare from windows. Um, a lot of it is just removing these distractions so that everything looks uniform. Um, and the way that your eye kind of removes these distractions for you, a camera just captures everything and can be very distracting. Um, next, exposure and luminosity is kind of an important um, integral part of the blending, trying to make the sunset look realistic while still having everything else exposed for, in a way that your eye kind of naturally corrects for you again, but in an image you'll notice these things being off. Um, and then lastly, distortion. Um, lens distortion and perspective distortion are two different um, phenomena that need to be um, both corrected individually. Lens distortion, um, in short, is when um, it's when straight lines in the image uh, appear curved or bent instead of straight. Um, and this is a result of uh, actual flaw in a lens um, that can be corrected. Um, and then perspective distortion actually has to do with your placement um, relative to your subject. Um, so here you can see, um, since I'm lower down by the pavement, obviously, um, the whatever's closest to the camera is going to appear larger than whatever's further away. So the base of this building is appearing larger than the top, which is then making it appear as if it's tipping back because I have my camera pointed upwards. Um, pers perspective distortion is correcting this so that everything appears straight. Um, so uh, in this specific image, um, let's take a look at what I did. Um, here's the original shot again, um, straight out of the camera. This is a raw image. Um, what I did is I did some basic raw editing to this image um, and came up with this, uh, bringing up the shadows, uh, mostly concerned about making the building exposed right because I know that I'm going to be bringing in a new sky. Um, but I also brought down the highlights in the sky a bit. Um, once that was done, I did bring that in as a smart object. 
you can see here this little icon it means that it's a smart object and what that means is that it's non-destructive i can after bringing this in after masking it or adding other layers i can still double click this layer and you'll see here in a minute um it will open up with all of my raw options in Adobe Camera Raw so that I can tweak this image after the fact if there are some little adjustments that I want to make. So I'll click OK on that and it'll take a second to reapply um, the adjustments. Um, so after that, I realized after taking the shot that I had left these uh, cigarette disposal trash bins in the shot, which I did not want. I was smart enough to take another shot um, without them and what I did is I simply masked that in. So I brought another image in from Lightroom um, and I, when I drug that image over this one, I held down shift so that everything aligned properly. Um, and you can see here um, that I've simply just taken a paintbrush and just simply masked over those. If your exposure matches, then you should have no problem just kind of brushing those two small areas out of the way. After that, I kind of focused on the sky replacement. Um, and this is where it gets a little bit tr tricky. Um, so typically, if you were to try to simply brush this in, um, you'd have a um, really hard time getting an accurate selection around the building here. Now you could use a pen tool as well, but the pen tool will give you a really sharp edge and may not look realistic in a gradient sense because if this really is the lighting, you'd expect to have a little bit of that lighting spill over the building. It's not gonna be a super clean um, cut. You want realistic edges. Um, and so this is where Lumosity um, masking really helps you out. So here's a look at the mask here. And this mask is um, just like any other mask. White is revealing or showing whatever's in this layer is white and whatever's black is not showing. Um, so I created this mask actually with an action, a luminosity action. And what this does is it will create a variety of brights, darks, and mid-tones in your channels. Now, Generally, when you're looking at the image, you'll have red, green, and blue selected, but these will be um, down below here. And as you go through them, you can see that it's um, different degrees of selection based on the brightness of the image. So this is the quickest way to work with Photoshop to say, hey, I want to grab the brightest of the bright areas or you know, most of the brights and um, not any of the darker areas. And this will give you a natural gradient edge that matches the look of the image instead of trying to brush over it. Um, so by holding down Command or Control and clicking on the picture here, you will select the brights in this case um, that's in that. If you go back to layers, for example, um, one thing I can do um, is now that I have this selected, I could even just go down here and I could make a curves adjustment. And what this is gonna do is now you can see that it is applied um, this luminosity mask to the curves. So now the curves that I make here are only going to adjust those um, brighter areas um, primarily. Now to further tweak this, sometimes if you push this real far, you can see that it still has some say on these darker areas down in here. And so to affect that further, what I've done is I've put that layer into a group and then I've added a layer mask to that group and hit um, Command or Control I and that will um, invert that layer mask to being all black. Now what I can do is um, I can grab a, a brush here and I can control what does show up or what doesn't. So now I can brush the sky and simply darken the sky. And what it's doing is it's basically becoming a, a stencil for you in a sense. It's giving you a guide so that if I do accidentally come over this a little bit, it's not gonna affect it as much as you might think it does because this group is still controlled by this layer mask underneath it too. Um, in effect, using two layer masks. Um, so let me delete this group here. Oops, that deleted the layer mask. Um, so that's in, in effect what I'm doing here is first I used this, I basically created this stencil to kind of be a safeguard in case I brushed over the building a bit. And then when I made this group, um, you can see that I've um, kind of brushed in over it to affect the sky. And that stencil has kept it from really affecting the building so that I've been able to paste that sky in very realistically. Um, after that, we moved on to some cloning, and this just takes some time and getting used to. It's a variety. I, I use the cloning tool, the healing brush. Um, sometimes, in some extreme cases, um, 
such as uh, including these cars in, I'm actually copying elements of the picture over to another, not just in cloning, but I'll actually use a lasso tool and select a piece of it, copy that onto a new layer and start pasting things in that way. Um, it just takes a little practice and a little time getting used to it. Um, you can see it's a variety of layers here that I've built up doing the cars. Um, but with time, you start getting a little better at knowing which tool is going to be the quickest way to um, to affect those areas that you're looking for. Um, here are two hue and saturation layers. I was talking about color correction, um, where I've kind of um, corrected some of the, the color. I felt the, the yellow from these lights was a little too strong, and so I um, kind of toned that down a bit. And then all of the yellow and the arrows um, on the the parking lot I brought out the blues same thing I didn't want those blues being very distracting so I kind of removed them down um, the grass is then uh, kind of the next thing I, I took to um, the grass is actually an interesting thing I made a, a new layer and I changed the blend mode to color and what you can do then is you can literally just brush on a color and it's only going to change the color of what you're brushing it's not going to affect the, the, the brightness or the luminosity um, here's a luminosity layer, um, or the saturation will only affect the colors that are already there, making them stronger or less, you know, more or less saturated. Um, if you change it to color, I've simply grabbed a dark um, green and painted over those areas. And then what I've done is I've grouped that green grass into its own group and added a curves to it. Now what this curves is letting me do is affect how dark or bright that green winds up being, how what shade I want my grass to be, essentially. Um, and that's totally a personal preference. Um, so after that, what I normally do is I'll grab all of my edits here, and I'll go ahead and do Command or Control G. Now what this is gonna do is it's gonna group them all into one layer, and I'll name this Edits, for example. That way I just have a little bit of a cleaner workflow and everything is in that. And then what I'll do is I will um, grab everything um, that I have so far, and I'll do a stamp visible layer. That's how I create this top layer. And what that does is it takes everything that's visible at this moment and it puts it, stamps it onto a new layer to be totally non-destructive. Um, the shortcut to do this is kind of a long one. You hold Shift, Option, Command, and then press E, or on a PC it would be Shift, Alt, Control, E, and that will create this new layer may take a minute because it's so large, layer four. Now what I've done is I've simply renamed that layer into um, DxO, and that's because DxO, um, along with PT Lens, are the um, filters that I use to control um, both lens distortion and perspective distortion. Um, so first I'll typically correct the lens distortion um, using PT Lens. I also have a blog post about that um, that I will link in the blog post here. Um, that you can read about how I use PT Lens to fix that. And then I'll typically use DxO Labs um, for the perspective distortion because it uh, has a really nice user interface for straightening all of your converging verticals. Um, that way I leave just my perspective, my, my distortion fixes in one layer. Um, so I can see the before and after on that. I can see the before and the after on the edit. Oops, this I would probably generally leave out like that. So I can see the the before and after for my raw conversion, but the true before and after. Um, yeah. So if you guys would love to hear more about this process or have any other specific questions, feel free to comment below. Um, as always, you can subscribe to my blog to learn more about uh, camera gear, workflow, and post-processing tips. Um, thanks, and have a great day.